<laughs> so um, uh, I think it's just past the hour. So welcome everyone who's joining. Uh, my name is Andre Spicer. I'm a professor of organizational behavior at the, the Business School at City University of London, formerly known as CAS. Um, and I'm here today with uh, one of uh, our great friends of the institution, um, Stefan Stern. So we're going to hear a little bit about his uh, work and leadership. But before we begin, let me just tell you a little, little bit about Stefan. So Stefan um, was a journalist for the, with the FT for quite some time um, and uh, had written a lot about management. Um, and he constantly still uh, writes a lot for The Guardian, for the Financial Times. And he's recently written a book uh, with Carrie Cooper about uh, questions about sort of um, leadership and management, uh, drawing on his expertise. So I think uh, Stefan will give us some uh, great insights on, on those kind of issues uh, as we're going. But I also should say that uh, Stefan's been a great friend to, to the business school over the years where he has um, uh, helped us judge our MBA competitions. He's helped us uh, put our thoughts out there and communicate clearly. Uh, and often has very insightful and incisive things to say about uh, business life. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, hand over to, to Stefan. So Stefan, welcome. Hi, and sorry for the gymnastics at the last minute, but I think I'm in a dark zone for my Wi-Fi, and I hope this is better. Just wave at me if, if it's still working. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for... Um, for coming along today and if you're watching at a later time. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about leadership, which is a timeless topic, of course, uh, which is good news for journalists and academics. We're always going to discuss it. We're always going to want to think about it uh, and what's going on under the heading of leadership, even if we come to the conclusion that we don't think we really want it anymore. But that's another conversation we can, we can get into, if you like. Um, what do we look to leaders for? Well, I mean, classically, conventionally, we always think that leaders should have some sort of sense of direction that they're giving us um, uh, perhaps a vision, whether it's a capital V or a lowercase V, that they can tell a story about where we're headed collectively as a, as a team, as a business, as an organization, or as a country. And clearly, leadership we're obsessed with at the moment, what's developing in uh, the United States, in Washington, DC, uh, because that job is the most studied, scrutinized leadership job in the world. Uh, we even call it the, sometimes the leader of the free world, which is also a contestable label, but uh, let, let's not pursue that now. And we're waiting to see. So the hold of that job, the hold of that office, perhaps for some time, can set some of the terms or define what we think of as leadership for good and uh, for ill. Um, now, lots of adjectives get applied to leadership, you know, like servant leadership. The idea that the leader really is there to serve other people. It's not about, it's not an ego trip. It's not, uh, it's not about you, it's about them. It's about the rest of the organization. It's also about what's sometimes grandly called legacy. But in other words, in plain terms, what you leave behind. You know, is the organization, is the business, the team in a better condition when you've finished being a leader than when you started? It's an, it's an important question for leaders, one that perhaps isn't always at the front of mind in leadership jobs because of the pressures of the present. But, uh, you know, the organization, we, we hope, the business, the team, whatever it is, will be there after you stop being the leader. And so that's a responsibility, too. It leads to the, the old joke about how one of the first things a leader should do, um, a cynical joke, I warn you, uh, that, that when the leader gets into the top job, got to find the, find the, search the organization to find the natural successor and uh, destroy them as soon as possible. But that's, that, that, that's a joke. That's not, uh, that's not serious. Um, uh, serious advice. Of course, you should want a team, a bench, as people sometimes say, of potential successes developing all the time. That is absolutely a leadership responsibility. Uh, it's called succession planning. It's also not always done terribly well. And again, that comes back to that ego point, the selflessness of, uh, uh, you know, wondering about other people more rather more than yourself. Uh, also in our conversation, perhaps the next minute or two, we can discuss the Differences really and imagine between leadership and management. My personal take is that um, we rather overemphasize and can waste a bit of time and energy uh, thinking too much about the alleged differences. I'm kind of with uh, Tom Peters, uh, who said to me when I, when I interviewed him for that book with Kerry Cooper that, um, you know, you really want leaders who can manage and managers who can lead. And uh, I mean, would you want to work for a leader who can't manage? Probably not. Uh, there's a big ask of one human being 
to be capable of both types of behavior. But then I think that is a key point about leadership that um, it must adapt. We don't really want one trick ponies in leadership jobs. Circumstances change, business cycle changes, uh, geopolitics change, innovations change the market and so on. And you know, one way of behaving, one way of acting is probably not gonna be good enough for any extended leadership uh, tenure, any leadership, any, any job you do for any length of time. You're gonna have to develop and grow. It's not, the, it's not a finishing line becoming a leader. It's, um, you know, your work is just starting as a leader. And some of you may be familiar with um, uh, Emilia Ibarra's uh, quite recent book, um, which is called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And it's absolutely in that order because as we know, it's a bit of a cliche, but we know that it can be quite hard to think your way into a new way of being. Maybe you actually have to start doing it first, act like a leader, and then some of the thinking will follow. So she's absolutely not saying that you've got to, you know, fake it uh, as a leader, but she, I think she is saying that when you step up to a leadership position, the, the skills and the behavior and the attitudes that you displayed to that point may not be sufficient in the new role. The demands on you, the, the accountabilities, the responsibilities may be greater, and you are going to have to uh, step up in your level of activity. And uh, uh, so that means new types of behavior, which may feel uncomfortable at first, which is why people talk about being outside a, outside a comfort zone. But it's, it's, in its own way, it's authentic. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a slippery word too that we can come on to. So, look, those are my top of the head thoughts about leadership. Um, uh, I, I personally don't feel we, I feel we always will need leaders, even if it is collective, even if it is team, even if it is distributed throughout an organization. I'm not a, a fan, although I'm a journalist, we, we do write about CEOs too much and about organizations not enough. But I'm not a fan actually of saying that there's one human being who somehow magically transforms an organization on his or her own. I don't really think that's how change happens. I think leadership is terribly important, but uh, uh, I think it takes more than one person. I think it's a team pursuit. Uh, but uh, Andre, those are just some starters to, to, to get going, but I, I, I hope perhaps in conversation, uh, we can stimulate some other, some other ideas as well. Okay, well, Stefan, thank you for those uh, great starters for 10, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's let's start with uh, with I know the book was a kind of I can't remember what it had the title was like myths of leadership or myths fe featured very strongly. Show yeah, well, I mean, yeah, this gets us into the conversation quite well because the book I did with Kerry in 2017 was called Myths of Management, mm. which was a nice alliterative title, and we ran through. Actually, we got I was hoping to come up with 50 with him. We got to 44, so it could have been 50 myths, but we didn't quite make it. Um, and then the follow up book was called very again very simply and practically how to be a better leader so the two books that i've got my name on one is the m word one is the l word but as i just said a moment ago actually <laughs> now it can be told just between ourselves um i think we can sometimes overemphasize the differences I, I mean i think management you know it's sometimes the poorer kid brother kid sister of leadership you know it's sort of it's seen as a bit banal smaller you know it's tasks quotidian you know it's sort of it's that sort of daily stuff and leadership capital l is exciting big visionary already mentioned visions uh, strategic top level and better paid you know the leadership jobs the top jobs are where the big money is and as our colleague um, laura Ebsen has pointed out amusingly you know <laughs> if you're working with a client or if you're consulting and it's leadership work or a session on leadership you can actually charge more i mean the fee the entry fee is more than for uh, honest to goodness management uh, training or development or even management consulting leadership is where the, the money is so those are the two books and um but they're myths in both which again i fear you know the media are partly responsible for perpetrating and spreading uh and as our former colleague uh joe lampel always used to say you know we need to dig deeper uh, dig deeper to find out what leaders are really like, dig deeper to find out what uh, management really looks like in practice and, 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 and what it feels like for the organisation. Mm. So, so what would be the most dangerous myths of management or leadership, if you just want to pick out a few ones that are your favourite? Yeah. Well, I think, and let's try and bring it together with leadership, I think the, that myth that it's the heroic soloist, you know, it's an individual, the superhuman, superman or woman, uh, and again, as I say, um, 
uh, I'm not a self-hating journalist, but, but, I, but I will say we, we, we a bit like the sports managers, we talk them up on their way up when the results look good in the initial year, 18 months. And pub, you know, quoted companies, stock market companies often have this sort of life cycle, the new lead and well, he, she's really sorted out the mess that was the inheritance there. And gosh, isn't it great? And then they go for a big deal, a really big uh, merger acquisition, huge deal, possibly get quite a lot of praise for that because we like that. Uh, the investment analysts quite like these sorts of things. The uh, investment bankers like them. The PR and marketing people like them. The consulting firms like them because it's deals, deal flow, there's commissions and fees, and it looks like activity. It looks purposeful. And then maybe a year or so later, we find out that once again, uh, uh, and Cass has done some very good work with this, of course, on M&A, uh, you know, maybe those really big ticket deals have just not um, created value or added value. In fact, they've destroyed value. And maybe the reputation of that CEO who only 18 months ago we were cheering on as a hero and as a swashbuckling deal maker is actually an egomaniac and out of control. And of course, in a way, I'm talking a bit about someone a bit like uh, Fred Goodwin at Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm sort of describing the trajectory that RBS had as he did these deals and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we called him Fred the Shred. And originally that was sort of with a hint of approval. And then lastly, as the results looked better and the ABN AMRO deal went wrong and so on and the crisis, we used the same name, Fred the Shred, but then our wise after the event, some of us again in the media said, well, you see, we knew, we knew he was uh, full of himself and out of control and, and so on. So the, the fickle finger of fate, you know, and fashion, and media approval, that, that boosts that myth of the heroic individualist. And I think we need to be careful about that one in particular. Are we setting leaders up to fail then? So if we're kind of, you know, boosting them up and people want to put a lot of hope in that they're going to solve all of the world's problems, and then inevitably they come along and show themselves as human or a little bit less than human, perhaps, <laughs> yes. in some cases, uh, do, are we part of the problem in terms of boosting them up too much? I think there must be a, a risk of that uh, with our, and again, not so much the academy, not so much the, the business schools as the media, but there is an interplay because some figures do become her heroes at business schools. And, you know, again, just to, this sort of show and tell uh, support group spirit, you know, Jeff Immelt at GE is someone I think when I was at the FT, I was writing pretty favorable pieces about it because he used to say a lot of very plausible and intelligent sounding things, it seemed to me. And I, and I liked his style. And of course, G was a very big and difficult job. But I think now that the, the jury's back in on his tenure, long tenure, and it's really not very favorable. And it turns out he did not really resolve successfully some of the fundamental challenges and uh, problems that uh, G faced, massive though they, they were. And so, yes, we probably do have very high expectations. We do set them up. And as I say, when I you know the Tom Peters line is right, we want people who can do both leadership and management at the same time. But then in reality, one human being to do all that, that's a lot. It's why some successful leadership teams obviously of, of, often are double acts, triple acts teams. And as you know, that concept of distributed leadership, or you know, we used to talk about delegation, is terribly important. And that perhaps does lessen some of the uh, pressure and tension on one single human being to come up with all the answers and to provide inspiration and vision nonstop. Mm -hmm. um, so I should note that if anyone has any comments or questions, please put them into the Q&A, which indeed I see someone has just done at this stage. So um, here's a question from Anora. Uh, so are mm -hmm. there any uh, unofficial, of course, uh, different uh, criteria for judging leaders of different genders or racial backgrounds or different kinds of myths? Oh, well, that's a terrific question, and we could easily spend the rest of the slot on that alone, um, but we, well, I don't suppose we can. But um, Yes, of course. And very, very few women CEOs in FTSE 100, the biggest London listed companies or in the Fortune 500, very, very few, ridiculously few. And again, we could have a discussion about why that's been. It's a longstanding thing. Except, of course, in certain cases where we notice that when a company is in severe difficulty, and this happens also in politics, of course, maybe a woman does get the top job. And of course, this is not so much what's called the glass ceiling as the glass cliff as it has been called, women and perhaps also perhaps people from a different, uh, from an ethnic minority, being given the big job finally when it is perhaps already an impossible or the odds massively against job. And, and I think there's been a, a pattern of that uh, too. And you might say with hindsight that Theresa May 
uh, time as PM was a, a kind of glass cliff assignment. We'll see if uh, something can be retrieved from Brexit in the next few months. But it was clearly an extremely difficult part. I've been criticised, but it was, it, was, it was difficult. So yes, I think um, there is a question there, um, whether it's in business, whether it's in politics and organisations. I mean, I think things have slowly, slowly, slowly improved a bit, but very slowly and not enough. I, 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 too many of the, I mean, I think the statistic was there are more CEOs in the FTSE 100 called Steve, than there are women CEOs in the FTSE 100. So uh, there's some progress to be made, I think, in, in having boardrooms and leadership teams that look more like the organizations that the leaders are leading and look more like the society and markets in which these businesses are operating. Yeah, absolutely. So we have another question, which is uh, linked back to this problem about failure. So is this the case that all leaders or particularly heroic leaders, their biography mm -hmm. eventually or inevitably ends in failure? That, there's a, again, there's a distinct chance of that, as you know, in, in, in Westminster, in British political context, it's certainly, it is certainly one of the almost cliches to say that all political careers end in failure. It's probably not 100% true, but it's largely true. In 1976, Harold Wilson retired, stepped down as prime minister before losing another election, before being kicked out by his party. Very rare uh, exception. Um, I mean, knowing when to go, is, as I say, is part of that legacy question. And it's extremely important and certainly better to go when people, you know, as they say in showbiz, you know, still calling for more rather than telling you to get off. Uh, especially if you have set up a proper succession in place, after you. Um, I think, you know, uh, Terry Leahy at Tesco might be another example of a CEO that we cheered on and on and on. Then they went for that big deal in the US with the Fresh and Easy Network that didn't work out for him. His legacy was actually difficult. His immediate successor, Philip Clark, had a very difficult time. It's taken a long time for Tesco to re regain its sort of uh, poise and uh, momentum as a business, uh, even though Leahy for 10 years clearly was really at the top of his game. So I think knowing when to step down and having prepared the, the successors is a key part of this and is one way of perhaps diluting or avoiding the worst disastrous endings and failure. But as Gary Hamill used to say, too many of these corporations seem to have a kind of, you know, what we used to call third world, developing country uh, system of leadership whereby only, only a coup could overthrow this sort of dictatorial uh, figure. Uh, we, we, should, we should try and avoid coups, you know, in the organisation and, in, and in, perhaps in countries as well. So so if if the bad leader kind of takes over and they find the naturalist successor and destroy them, the good leader <laughs> should kind of build some degree of succession, uh, it seems to be what you're saying. Uh, yeah. And that's a thing to focus on. So what would you think about there? What are the things that need to be thought about in terms of succession planning and developing an, a life for the organisation beyond you as a leader? The that's really a good and big question um clearly what stage of development is the business or organization at what are the challenges coming up over the next three to five years what sort of people therefore are you going to need to take up that leadership role and is it it's fair to say that it's only one person or is it a cadre of three five 10 people, how are they being prepared? Are they being given in the cliche stretch assignments? Are they being given a chance to learn and crucially a chance to fail uh, and learn from mistakes, perhaps on a small scale, perhaps quite a long way from HQ <laughs> where uh, the name and the reputation of both the business and the individual don't suffer too badly. You, you may know what Charles Handy always said about running what I think was then called Malaya uh, for Shell, Malaysia, of course. Um, that he could get all sorts of things wrong on the other side of the world from London and, and, and the Netherlands and so on. And no one knew before the internet uh, and real-time communications, no one had a clue what he was getting wrong about purchasing price of oil and so on. But he learned a lot. He also learned he wanted to leave Shell, but that's, a, that's, that's another matter. But that classically would be the way of doing it. Um, accelerated learning and of course business schools do a lot of this with the sort of exec mba or other sort of accelerated learning programs it, um uh which is a uh, perhaps a, a, a risky thing in the sense that there's a big assumption there that you can accelerate learning and i think if you i think accelerated learning's probably got to be done very carefully and and well 
because just because someone's rushed through a course and given a country to run doesn't mean they've learnt and it doesn't mean they've developed the skills. So that assessment, management of the performance of the future leaders is extremely important. Okay, so the other thing which you mentioned is um, when people step into a, a management or leadership role, often they're promoted into it for one set of competencies. Maybe you're a great right. cost cutter or you're right. a fantastic visionary. But when you end up in the next leadership role, those competencies aren't often enough and you need to avoid being that one trick pony. I wonder if you could kind of expand on this point about how to avoid getting stuck in a kind of leadership competency trap, or in other words, how to avoid being a one trick pony. Yes, yes, great question, very important. Yes, you rise up vertically. I mean, people have talked about T-shaped leaders, haven't they? Because you rise up vertically through perhaps a siloed bit of the business, but then at a higher level, you've got to look across like the top bar of a T and have an understanding of and uh, an appreciation of what the challenges are. And if you're just the finance person or just the marketing person or just the R&D person, then you are at a slight disadvantage initially. So I suppose the word I haven't used yet, it's been implied, but, but humility, you know, having the, having the humility and the courage to stand before the top team and say, well, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I have been good at. Here's what I don't know. I need your help. I mean, that's a high trust thing. Of course, in a cutthroat, vicious environment, that's not going to work very well. I was very struck. There was a big piece in the New York Times about uh, Joe Biden, just to come back to politics, mm. um, how he, he'd he said to, there's a clip in the long piece about how he won, because it was a well-disciplined and well-run campaign. And, and, and he's even now showing, I think, quite significant sort of calm and maturity as he waits for the US Constitution to do its work. But he, there's this bit in this piece where he grabs a senator from Ohio, Democratic senator from Ohio, uh, Sherrod Brown. Of course, they're all in masks and so on and still because it's the virus time. But he says to him candidly and directly, uh, with great honesty, he says, I really need you to help me. And one thing people say about Biden is that he has this sort of warmth, uh, you know, tactile, you know, personal quality, but also vulnerability. I mean, he's someone who really talks about the personal loss he's experienced his failures, his setbacks, he's run twice for the presidency before unsuccessfully. And people may have their concerns about um, a 78 year old guy taking on this job of the leadership of the free world. But one thing he has shown is that he doesn't pretend to know everything. And I think that's, that is quite an interesting example for leaders and future leaders. You know, you don't know everything. You may not know what you don't know. You're going to need help. And it's fine to ask for help. And it's fine to admit to those areas that you don't know enough about. And that, that, I think that's going to be quite a disarming and in almost you know endearing way for a new leader to step into a big job that it is a it's a team effort and just because i'm getting the biggest paycheck i've got the nicest office and the biggest car parking space and the best hotel to stay in it doesn't mean i've suddenly become some a genius who knows everything uh, i don't know everything but when leaders believe their own so I think we're having some problems with uh, the stream at the moment. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them into the uh, into the chat. Um, and if Stefan doesn't come back in a few seconds, I'll ask him to. Uh, shall I just keep going with a few? Please, please, please. There we are. Keep going. We, we're on. That was an intermission, as we used to say. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's an endless topic. I think that's that's the other point I really was trying to start say at the start. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about hierarchy. Can we be flatter? You know, this thing called holacracy that's very fashionable. Do we really need leaders at all? Can't we be self-managed teams? Can't we, in this era of agile, can't we just be more responsive to customers? Aren't the customers really our leaders? Do we need some sort of patriarchal, old-fashioned figure at the top telling us what to do? I think those are all interesting questions. And very difficult to generalize between different organizations and businesses because the, the, the culture will be so different and what people are used to will be so different. Um, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't assume too much about leadership. I mean, I suppose that's what I'm really saying. It will be different in a context uh, of the organization, it will be different in the context of the business cycle and good leaders adapt to those, to those different demands. Okay, so I think we've got one final question to sort of round things off. So this is from Vincent, and it's a great question. So how, how has the pandemic taught us anything differently about leadership? So what, what do we now know about leadership following this pandemic? 
Well, it comes back to your other question about gender, maybe. Uh, <laughs> we know that certain women leaders around the world seem to have handled this a lot calm, more calmly with more greater maturity and sensitivity than some male leaders around the world. But we mustn't, mustn't presume that the, the, the correlation is causation and so on. But I think the leaders who have done well, and many of them are women, have been very serious about the data and have acted quickly, even when they didn't have all the data. Uh, it does look as though, let's name names, it does look as though the UK, the US, uh, Brazil, maybe India, have been led by people who were very reluctant to take necessary action soon enough for different reasons and slightly macho reasons, frankly. Whereas countries that perhaps face fewer problems like New Zealand, maybe like Taiwan, but were really red hot on the data and took action far South Korea, Vietnam, uh, were quick to act dis decisively, bravely, uh, at the risk of overdoing it, but because they took the precautionary principle that when, when something's really critical, you've, you have got to act. You can't wait for the perfect decision. You haven't got time and you can't be too clever. I'm afraid some of the messages from the British government were, were very clever and plausible sounding about why they didn't need to copy other countries, but it turns out that they were wrong on that and were preparing for the wrong sort of pandemic. So be serious about data, be ready to act, even when you only have 65, 70% of the information you might like, because you'll never have 100% of the information you want. And you've got to have that courage to take act, but then be ready to adjust and adapt to the results of those decisions. Okay, great. So I think we'll round it up there. So thank you, Stefan. He's, I guess some sort of takeaways for me is this importance of not admitting you know anything, the kind of Biden rule, let's call it that. Uh, the, the courage rule. So let's call that Jacinta, the Jacinta rule, which is uh, be courageous and follow the data sometimes and then prepare your successes as well. I don't know uh, who we call that. We're not going to call it the Kim Jong-il um rule or something like that, but uh, <laughs> uh, nonetheless. So uh, before everyone leaves me, let just remind you of uh, upcoming uh, events which we have. Um, so in uh, next week we have the next big thing from Vasilios uh, Katsos um, and he's going to, he's a venture capitalist um, and a pharmaceutical entrepreneur. He's going to talk about uh, innovations and identifying the next big thing, particularly around technical innovations and entrepreneurship. And then the final uh, seminar for this, uh, this kind of part of the seminar series is uh, really, I'm very happy we've got David Weingrow coming, who's an archaeologist and has just written a book with the uh, late David Graeber, which is, uh, I think, going to be a, a next year's bestseller, which is about popular delusions and group size. So it's kind of a big history of human human life, a 30,000 uh, year history, a little bit like uh, the um, sa uh, sa Sapiens. Um, so I'd recommend you come along and listen to that. So let me just thank Stefan again for his uh, contributions. Um, and we'll see you all uh, in next week. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.